Okay, good morning. My name is Scott Geyer. I am the AIM coordinator for BLM Alaska. I'm here to present, uh, along with Tina Bob, to raise your hand, Tina, from Alaska National Heritage Program, uh, our AIM pilot uh, in Alaska. Uh, before I begin, I'd like to recognize some of our participants. I know you can't see them uh, at the bottom of the page. They're Dave Yoko from the Arctic Field Office, uh, Emily, of course. Katurgis and Matt Bobo from the National Operations Center, and Jason Carl and Sarah McCord from the USDA on audit. I guess you could say AIM really began in Alaska in 2011 when there was a national tour of the National Petroleum Reserve by folks from the National Operations Center in Washington office. Uh, after the tour was agreed that AIM could work and would be a useful tool in Alaska, uh, even though it had been really applied to Western Greenland lands up to that point, and in particular the MPRA. Uh, the National Petroleum Reserve was originally established in 1923 uh, and with 23 and a half million acres. It's the largest tract of undisturbed public land in the United States. The NPRA is ecologically important with critical uh, habitat or nesting grounds for many species of migratory birds and waterfowl and is home to up to half a million caribou of the Teshipak and, and Western Arctic caribou birds. Uh, the region sustains many species of fish and wildlife, and are, which are the foundation for the subsistence culture of the Inupiat natives that live in this region. Uh, current management direction mandates the development of oil and gas resources while ensuring the protection of vital uh, subsistence resources and wildlife habitat. So in 2012, we began a five-year pilot project teaming up with our partners, the Alaska National Heritage Program, the National Operations Center, and USDA Coordinata. Um, AIM implementation began uh, with framing some of the issues through identification of management questions and monitoring objectives. Uh, one of the key steps was the development of this conceptual model. You'll see here I have no information. You can read this, but I just want to put this up there because we spent a lot of time with it uh, developing this for the Arctic, um, identifying ecosystem drivers, structures, and functions, and processes uh, for the Arctic ecosystem. Uh, out of this, through the process development of this, that conceptual models was a set of core uh, economic, um, eco excuse me, ecosystem indicators emerging, which were the core indicators on the left, which you see and are familiar with, and on the right, a suite of supplemental indicators. Uh, each of the key functions from the uh, conceptual model, we identified uh, indicators that provided useful and importantly measurable information to address these functions. In some cases, the core indicators did not provide adequate information to evaluate environmental change in the Arctic, and so we added supplemental indicators to more fully address those functions. And you can see those on the right here. Uh, Tina in a moment will talk about uh, some of those indicators active later in mass depth measurements. Um, just wanted to note those these are asked that uh, many of these indicators will be collected with the most sensing that will actually be discussed uh, later today. So AIM long-term monitoring framework will assist BLM management in Alaska uh, on important regional issues such as subsistence, oil and gas mitigation, wildlife, the native way of life and socioeconomic impacts, uh, climate change, uh, integrated activity plans, and scenario plan. So now Tina will come up, and she's going to talk about uh, sample design. And Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, let me make sure my pointer works. Um, Scott uh, mentioned the importance of the indicator selection, but another really important part of our uh, sample design was the development of this uh, landscape stratification. And our goal was to develop a stratification where e each stratum would have a similar vegetation, soil types, and ecological processes, such that plots within a stratum would respond in a similar direction to a given disturbance, such as climate change or uh, development. Um, so we lack detailed soil maps, so we, were, we used a physiographic subdivision as well as artificial deposit mapping uh, combined with land cover mapping to develop these strata for our, for our sample design. 
And uh, this map here shows our aim plots within our sampling blocks. And it also shows our entire uh, sample stratification, which we developed across the North Slope of Alaska. But here, just showing NPRA. I'd like to point out probably the most important physiographic division in NPRA to see the orientation. We have the um, division here between the coastal plain, which is this east-west line across NPRA. Everything to the north is the coastal plain, and everything to the south of that is the uh, foothills rising up to the uh, crest of the, the Brooks Range Mountains. So I'm just going to show you a couple of examples of the dominant sampling strata to give you a little orientation to NPRA. Um, we have a list there of our entire stratification on the left, uh, grouped by physiographic regions. So you can see that Brooks Range foothills combined with the coastal plain make up 90% of NPRA. And the example, the photos on the right show the foothills plastic tundra stratum. This is 43% of NPRA. Um, the, the zoomed in photo shows kind of a classic plastic uh, formation. This is the, the zonal vegetation for this type, and it also is susceptible to changes from climate warming. We expect to see some changes to uh, shrub height. Uh, the other example is from the coastal plain. We have the coastal plain moist tundra and wetlands making up 28% uh, of the coastal plain. And the coastal plain is a vast low-lying region of NTRA. It's made up of a mosaic of fall lakes and moist polygonal tundra. We have the uh, moist tundra in between the basins, and basins have the uh, fall lakes, oriented fall lakes, and also wetland vegetation. Uh, the entire region is underlain by uh, polygonal uh, ice wedge permafrost, and this is uh, susceptible to changes in, in terms of climate warming. And you can see in the moist tundra here, we have the water features in, along the contours of the ice wedge polygon. Those are the beginnings of thermocarst pits. And that's what happens when the ice wedge comes in contact with the surface of the water because ice begins to melt and you have these, these uh, thermocarst pits developing. So that's one change we're seeing already. And we also expect to see changes in the basin from uh, lake drainage and also changes to the wetland, central wetland drying. So we have been installing AIM plots in NCRA for three years. We have 118 monitoring plots. And I'm going to give you some examples, some summaries of our core indicators, uh, species composition and canopy structure. And I'm also going to show some examples of uh, our supplemental indicators, the active layer depth and the moss stuff depth. And just as a, a brief uh, definition of the active layer, it's the, the, the thaw depth, the thaw soil above the permafrost. It's the biologically active portion of the, uh, the soil profile. And in the foreground there, this is the probe we use to measure the active layer, and it's a non-invasive, non-destructive sampling technique. Um, so I used ordination to show the uh, similarity in species composition among the AIM plots, which are the symbols, and the uh, sample strata, which are the colors. And I also wanted to show the relationship of the strata to some of these measures environmental variables and indicators. So within the York Nation, the plots are arranged according to similarity in species composition. The plots that are close, uh, similar to one another position uh, next to each other and plots that are dissimilar far apart. The overall pattern in the ordination reveals the underlying environmental gradients within the data set. So then we can take our measured environmental variables and indicators and compare those to the ordination uh, uh, configuration. So here we have the vectors showing the direction of positive correlation with each of those measured indicators, and the length of that vector indicates the strength of that correlation. So briefly, we have our um, tide marsh strata here associated with high pH and high conductivity. The pinks and oranges are our wetland plots associated with thick organic horizons. Blues and greens, the moist tundra plots, those are associated with thicker moss stuff layers. To the far left of the ordination, we have plots with a lot of exposed mineral soil. Those are, have very, very deep active layer depths. So we can also use this ordination to evaluate the heterogeneity within each sample. So I've just drawn an outline around, around all the plots within a stratum, so you can take that as a heterogeneity indication. And these are the three most heterogeneous 
sample strata. These are the tide marsh and the two plus plain strata. They're uh, frequently disturbed, contain many uh, states of vegetation succession. Uh, in contrast, all the rest of the strata are relatively tightly grouped, and we can think of the circles around the, the plot grouping as kind of our, our baseline variation. And going forward, we'll use this information to evaluate um, compositional change when, when we do remeasurement. So to move on to canopy structure, I've summar summarized canopy structure across the wetlands, the moist tundra, and the shrublands. And I want to point out across the majority of the Arctic, this, the trend is to have the herbaceous vegetation, which is mostly sedges, overtopping the shrub canopy. And this is certainly the trend for most of NTRA. The shrublands are really minor components. And I'd like to call your attention to this particular one, Foothill Suffolk Tundra. We already saw a picture of it, where the shrub height is very close to the herbaceous height, and the standard deviations are relatively tight as well. And this is uh, an area where we expect to see some impacts from climate warming. We expect there's a predicted uh, increase in shrub height going forward. So to show this with a picture, we have our graminoid overstory with the shrubs in between. And you can see this can really take a five centimeter increase in shrub height to shift the structural dominance from graminoid overstory to shrub overstory. And that would have a pretty significant uh, consequences for canopy structure and habitat. And this is actually a trend we've seen with some of the um, tundra warming exper experiments in, in the region. So, uh, the final indicator I'd like to uh, show you is some um, results from the active layer and moss stuff um, measurements. And the, um, again, the active layer is that thawed portion of the soil above the permafrost. And uh, the moss stuff is a component of the active layer measurement. And I really like this slide, thank you, Eric. <laughs> From, it's a, um, shows the relationship of the moss stuff measurement to the active layer, uh, where you have a thinner moss stuff on the left hand side, we have a thicker active layer. And where the active, where the permafrost rises up here, you can see we have a thick moss stuff layer and a um, thinner active layer above the permafrost. So here I've summarized the active layer across all the wetlands and the moist tundras. You can see that we have a similar trend here with the thicker moss stuff layers with, uh, associated with the uh, thinner, thinner active layer depth. If you recall the ordination, we have the moist tundras here where we're associated with thicker moss stuff horizons, uh, la layers above the soil horizon. And we do have a, uh, across the board, we have a predicted increase in the depth of the active layer. The active layer controls soil productivity and rooting depth. So we expect to see some of the changes that we're already predicting um, occurring uh, along with this uh, increase in active layer, such as some um, uh, increase in shrub growth, among other changes. So uh, moving forward for the next step for AIM, terrestrial AIM in Alaska over the short term, we uh, would like to develop a range of variation metrics for each stratum. And we intend to fully implement the remote sensing component. And I think there'll be a description of some of that um, later on in the symposium. And over the long term, we're going to move into the uh, change detection and plot remeasurement. And this is my, my inset here just shows the hypothetical uh, plot remeasurement scenario where we have the range of variation of the original plots with the circle and triangle. And the arrows representing a change in with uh, a, a change with the remeasurement of in species composition. So we'll be able to evaluate the, both the uh, magnitude and the direction of change by plots and by stratum. Then we can ask whether or not the plots within that stratum have shifted outside of our baseline and um, you know, using the circle as our, as our baseline measurement. And <clears throat> we'll also be able to identify drivers of change, um, whether it's climate warming or, or other disturbance. So one of the final uh, long-term goals for terrestrial aim in Alaska is to expand the protocol um, beyond the Arctic, uh, expand it to the rest of the BLM lands, including uh, boreal, that would require reevaluating our, our monitoring indicators and expand, adapting them for um, the rest of the state. So with that, Scott and I can take any questions you might have. Go 